have a good Angular day. Let's start the keynote. Please welcome Miles and Rado with applause. San Francisco office uh, as part of the Angular team. I specifically will focus on uh, TypeScript development in Google. Kyonin kara hatsan no koto ga okorimashita. Sumimisen, Angular de. Ja, uh, あまりに日本語がわかりません。だから英語でなします。ごめんなさい。So <laughs> uh, as I was saying, um, a lot of things have happened in Angular in the past year. So Rado and I have a lot to talk to you about today. Um, so we wanted to start off by first uh, talking about uh, some of the growth that we've seen in the Angular community. Um, and then also some of the challenges that that has uh, presented us with and how we try to address those challenges. Um, and then Rado is going to tell you about some of the cool new features that uh, came out with version 8 of Angular, as well as um, talk to you about some things that are still in progress, um, such as the IV rendering and, and, and integration with Bazel. Um, and then finally, I will tell you uh, a bit about some stuff we've been working on in Angular components that isn't ready quite yet, um, but we hope you'll be excited. Uh, so jumping right in, uh, let's talk about the Angular community. That is all of you guys. Um, as you probably know, the Angular community is something that is very important to us on the Angular team. We spend a lot of time and effort trying to grow and engage with um, the community. And in fact, you know, that's why Bob and I are here today talking to you. And so the best way that we have to really measure the growth in our community is by looking at the numbers um, to our developer site, angular.io. And so you can see from the start that uh, from 2017 to 2018, uh, we went from uh, under a million 30-day uh, active users to 1.5 million 30-day active users. And so that's uh, more than a 50% jump uh, in the size of our community. And um, you know, this is obviously awesome. We're super excited about this. Uh, but at the same time, it, it does present some challenges for the team in order to keep up with uh, the growing the size of the community. And so. Uh, in order to kind of illustrate the, the challenges, I think it's helpful to visualize um, what the Angular organization looks like. And so we can visualize it um, like this as a pyramid where we have the, the base here is the community. Um, and so these are the people that are you know, using Angular in their projects, they're contributing PRs to us, they're filing issues and bugs and things. Um, and then uh, towards the top of the pyramid, we have the Googlers and the open source collaborators that make up the Angular team and do the you know day to day development. Of Angular. And so, uh, basically, the problem with uh, with our community growing so fast is that uh, our team doesn't grow at the same rate. So we wind up with you know a, a <laughs> uneven looking pyramid like this. Um, and so the, the this means that it becomes harder for us to you know, keep up with all the issues that are coming in, harder to respond to the pull requests, uh, 
and just more difficult to maintain the same level of engagement with the community. And so uh, in order to try to help with this problem, we earlier this year launched a new program called Angular Collaborators. And the goal of this program is to scale the development of Angular through collaboration with the open source community. And so um, basically what we're doing with this program is that we're taking a slice off this uh, bottom section of the pyramid and we're taking the, uh, the, the contributors who have had the most impact and like have been the most helpful to us on the team and we're trying to elevate them into full members of the team. Um, and so this means you know, inviting them to, to our meetings, assigning them a mentor to help them get started, and um, just really making sure that we include them as a full member of our team. And so we have a number of goals for this program. One is obviously, as I mentioned, uh, to, to help scale up the development of Angular. Um, then it's also really important to us to increase our team diversity. Uh, so we think that you know the more number of different people we have from different backgrounds with different perspectives that are going into the decision making process in Angular, um, the better the quality of those decisions is going to be. Um, and then we also want to engage more with the community and kind of um, create opportunities for some of these community members. Um, because they've already been doing awesome work for us for a long time. And, and we think this is a really good way to, to recognize that work. Um, and then we also think that this will help uh, ensure the long-term success of the Angular project. Because the more people are invested in the, the project, the longer the future of the project will be. And so then, uh, Earlier this year, uh, through this program, we have already brought on nine new collaborators. Um, so you know, nine new members of the Angular team. Um, and I know at least one of these people is here today. Uh, Jolly Passion will be out there somewhere um, because he has a talk later today, actually. Uh, he'll be talking about Angular Elements um, at 1.15, and he has much better Japanese skills than me, so uh, if you're having trouble understanding me uh, and are interested in Angular Elements, then go uh, listen to this talk later. Uh, and now I will pass it off to Rado to tell you a little bit about the Angular ecosystem. Thank you, Miles. <coughs> All right, so um, as well said, uh, Angular it's not just a framework, it's a community. We think of it as a big ecosystem and, uh, with many, <clears throat> many important aspects to, of it uh, that we want to discuss. The one thing where we, when we set out to build Angular and share Angular with you is uh, it's very important for us that Angular provides you a reliable ecosystem that you can use it to build applications. You're building, you serving your users. Uh, reliability doesn't come for free. We have to we work uh, hard on it. <clears throat> and um, as part of that promise, it's very important for us that the framework itself has this evergreen fin. So if you haven't heard uh, the word evergreen before, um, usually people describe our current set of browsers as evergreen. Right? So Chrome is evergreen because it continuously upgrades itself and if you've been doing web development for a long time, like so I've been doing web development for 10 years now, maybe you remember back in the days of uh, you know, IE6, Internet Explorer 6, where you stuck with this browser and it had bugs and you had to work around the bugs and it just felt so so powerless, right? Uh, the, bro the browser was stuck in time and you had to always support those bugs because the users were using those old browsers. And then the browsers, figure out this nice evergreen scheme where they get auto-upgraded so we never have to be stuck supporting very old browser. So that feeling of empowerment that you get as a developer from support from your users using new browsers, we want you to have that from using our Angular framework. So the framework is always evolving, uh, but it's evolving in a way that doesn't cost you anything. Right? So it's uh, very important for us that 
you get the uh, evergreen feeling from the angular frank feed. The other important consideration when that goes into designing the framework is scalability. So we want Angular to scale as the applications grow. Right? The applications you really start small, you have one set of requirements, you work, uh, you know, you, you have a certain set of users, and let's say you're very successful, your application demands grow, you want more users, so you, uh, you need more from your framework. We want Angular to be the framework you use along this journey as your application goes. Uh, so one way to visualize this is uh, this kind of uh, a, a chart. Um, if we look around our big ecosystem, as Miles mentioned, we have billions of users, uh, and you look at kind of the apps our users are writing, um, they, they roughly follow fall on this uh, chart. So in one end, we have these very big apps. You have billions of users, but we have very few of them. Right? And then as you decrease the number of users, you increase kind of the requirements, you get these kind of enterprise apps in the middle. <laughs> you have, I don't know, a few thousands maybe of them. And then you have millions of tiny demo apps, educational apps, and like little apps that you start to learn to handle with. Um, so when we set out to uh, build Angular version 2, like that was version 2, now we just call it Angular, um, this is what we try to to uh, provide. We try to provide a framework that really helps uh, when you're building apps in this spectrum. So all the way from the tiniest apps to all the enterprise apps, and maybe the really big apps, they're very really special. So maybe we weren't, it wasn't as important for us at the time. Uh, a lot of the lessons from AngularJS, again, if you've been in this uh, ecosystem a long time, you know, AngularJS preceded this, and all the lessons from AngularJS went into uh, what we, uh, why we targeted this. AngularJS was uh, it had a little bit of a problem trying to scale up to the enterprise apps. So that's what we did and in 2016. I was part of this original team. Uh, you can ask me afterwards about how that uh, how that felt at the time. It was Green, Greenfield, uh, was the empty GitHub project, and. Um, so that's what we set out to do. What actually came out, I would say, was more like this, right? So around 2016, Angular really had a sweet spot right here in the enterprise apps, like these medium-sized apps that people really enjoyed using dependency injection and uh, you know, template syntax. Um, but uh, maybe some of the small apps, it was a little bit hard to get started with Angular. And also the, the really big apps uh, with their demands were not best served, served by the framework at that time. So for the last three years, we try to keep this core and really grow out, right? And uh, we've been, uh, in, as you look through our uh, features, what we've launched, you see how uh, they're really trying to support scaling down and scaling up. So I'll talk a little bit more about Ivy in a second, but Ivy is a new rendering engine that we're building inside Angular. And Ivy once already will allow us to really go all the way down to the really tiniest of apps. So that's something that Angular still uh, uh, needs needs to improve on to be able to capture maybe things that are not even an application per se. Maybe it's just a page and you want to drop one component. So Ivy, maybe with Angular Elements, will be able to go down and support the tiniest of uh, apps. And <coughs> How do we scale up to the really giant apps of the world? Um, so actually, Google, being part of Google, we have some of those apps, like Google Web Search and Gmail. They're not using Angular, but we know the lessons of how, what do they need. We know the requirements. And uh, the kind of two key technologies that would be needed to support those apps is server-side rendering and uh, per-component lazy loading. So those technologies. Uh, we're working with Prototyping to bring them uh, better supported to Angular, and they are the requirements needed to support the giant apps of the world, uh, the ones where one byte can cost you, you know, thousands of dollars. All right, so that's, uh, that's all I have to say about the, the big picture, how we think about developing the Angular framework and the Angular ecosystem. Now let's get into the details. So we got a version 8 release uh, recently in May. We are following again, part of this reliability um, story. We fo we are following semantic versioning, releasing twice a year, very 
very uh, predictable schedule. Um, so this is the first release of this year, and you'll get another one following for the end of the year. Uh, we do follow Sandler, so every major release means there might be a breaking change. We do try to keep the breaking changes to a minimum. So just because there might be, it doesn't mean we're, we're going breaking everything. But uh, there are a few small breaking changes in version 82. And again, it's very important for us that the upgrade storing is not painful for you, right? So it's not useful to have the greatest new framework if your application is stuck at the old, uh, the old version, right? Our framework, we want it to be evergreen. To that end, we provide uh, many, many, uh, uh, many tooling, many tools to support upgrading Angular. So if you go to upgrade Angular.io, there's a nice form where you can say, I'm upgrading from here to here. This is going to describe your application. It will tell you <coughs> what you need to do to upgrade it, uh, what are the parts that might be easy and parts that might be hard. So very much recommend you do that. And moreover, for the things that are fully automatable, ng-upgrade uh, will automatically upgrade the parts that need to be, um, <coughs> that need to be upgraded. So if something is absolutely mechanizable, trivial to upgrade, uh, we'll do it for you. So you don't need to waste any of your time upgrading and you get to use the newest feature. Um, a lot of the lessons that go into building NG upgrades uh, come from Google internally. So again, we're part of Google and internally we have a lot of applications, uh, the order of like thousands of Angular applications and they, they, scale, they go, they have some very large ones like Google uh, Cloud and we have a lot of very small ones too. Um, so we got the whole spectrum that I just showed you a few seconds ago. And we are responsible for upgrading all of them in, at the same time. So this is something that uh, Google is, uh, Google internal development is uh, built in a way where all the code lives in one big repository and there's one single version of Angular that all of those applications run. So when we press a button, we upgrade Angular, all of them have to work with this version. So we do that internally, and the lessons we learn from the internal upgrade, we bake into the tools that we provide to you, so your upgrade is also painless. And, um, you know, that, that's the goal we set for ourselves, and we're getting uh, good feedback from the community that we are reaching this goal, but again, uh, please talk to me afterwards if you if had some painful upgrades. Uh, what we see here is Air France, KLM, uh, this is a major Angular user, a big uh, airline company using Angular. Um, <coughs> they have had easy upgrade path, um, and so easy that they decided to write a blog post about it, and uh, really, uh, really, uh, really benefit from the easy upgrade. Uh, they even measured how long it has taken them. So from V2 to V6, from V2 to V4, it took them 30 days. That was that's that's painful, right? We, we don't want to be there uh, again. 30 days of um, one engineering time. So the time you could be spending building features, you just have to build great. From four to five, it went down. And from six to seven, it was down to one day. And from seven to eight, we don't, they, we don't have their data, but from what I hear, uh, it's just as easy. All right, so that's uh, all for upgrade. Now, some new features in V8. So one, uh, the one thing we're excited about is uh, Differential loading uh, is a way for your application code size to get smaller. And that's something we're bringing in with V8. What does differential loading mean? So we have the evergreen browsers, right? The modern browsers that are out of grading. They, they allow the modern JavaScript syntax. So uh, when I write ECMAScript version 2017, 2019, I can ship it to my evergreen browser and it works. Um, that's one part of the story. There's another part of the story, which is the legacy process. And I don't know how many of you have to support that, but I know in Google we have to support i11 for many of our projects. We have to support old browsers. The old browsers, the legacy browsers, they need polygons. We can still write modern syntax, but the bundle has to carry a cost. You have to carry polyfills because the polyfills allow us to use the modern syntax in all browsers. And uh, now you realize if I create one bundle to serve for both browsers, it has to be the lowest common denominator. It has to be the, the big bundle that carries the border fields. 
And here where the pressure loading can come and make a difference is for what if I serve one bundle for evergreen browsers without the polyfills, that bundle will be much smaller. And for legacy browsers, we still have to serve the big bundle. And that's, uh, that's what uh, differential loading supports in version 8. And um, we have one uh, Angular application ourselves, which is Angular IO. That's our documentation site. Of course, it's written in Angular. And on that uh, site, we see 41k K of savings. And roughly, we think uh, what we hear is differential loading can save up to <coughs> 7 720 percent, uh, depending on the size of your application. And the, the actual mechanism of differential loading is very simple. It doesn't require any server-side change. So this is very nice. The browsers uh, have this uh, they have this support for these two script types. So script type module would only be interpreted by modern browsers, by evergreen browsers, and they'll serve the smaller bundle. And for the old browser script no module would serve uh, this bundle for old browsers. They would not understand what no module means, and modern browsers would understand no module, skip that, and therefore only one of those two things will be served to one of the two types of browsers. So just with this HTML change, you can have differential serving and have uh, the benefits of smaller bundle for modern browsers. So there's really no reason not to use this, so I encourage you all to go and try this for your applications. All right, uh, one more feature that uh, happened in uh, uh, version 8, route configures in dynamic imports. So the configuration in uh, version 7 was based on this string syntax with a pound, hash sign, uh, pound sign. Uh, this was syntax we invented. It's really, there's no reason to use this uh, when ECMAScript itself supports dynamic imports. So in JavaScript, you can write import. This import is not an Angular import. This is a, something part of the language, part of ECMAScript. So you can write import and um, then lazy load your module and uh, support lazy loading of dynamic imports this way. And uh, by the way, this is one of those examples where the migration is so simple that instead of us asking you to do it, ng-upgrade will do this translation for you. So this is something that we changed in version 8. It's very small, but uh, aligns it better with JavaScript standards. All right, so that's all I have for version 8. One second. All right, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, some uh, more forward-looking uh, exciting projects. Project Ivy is probably the one you've heard about if you Followed Angular development in the last one year. Uh, it is a complete uh, refactoring, rethinking of Angular internals while maintaining the external APIs the same. So uh, the way I like to describe this, it's like uh, changing the engine of a car, except the car is moving on the highway uh, very fast because all of you are writing Angular applications, and we want to provide this new engine uh, for you that gives you all sorts of benefits without ever slowing down, without stopping your application development. So it is a renderer, it's, it's a part that uh, internally talks to the DOM. It, uh, it's a thing that makes the Angular templates work. Uh, that's what we call the renderer. And here are the goals we set ourselves for Ivy. So we want Ivy to create smaller bundles. So goal size, again, is very important. Uh, we know that if you if your bundle is smaller, it loads faster, the users have better experience. So they'll, they'll most li they're more likely to come back to your website if it has smaller call size. Uh, the compilation for the templates itself should be faster with Ivy. That's our goal for ourselves. Simpler debugging. Debugging is a fact of life. You have to debug your applications. We want to support a nicer way of debugging with Ivy um, because change detection um, is a mechanism that goes behind the scenes of every Angular application. And when it works, it's great, but when it doesn't, it's very hard to know even where to begin to debug it. So we want to improve that. Improve type checking. So the templates in Angular does, do have some type checking, but it's not complete. So sometimes you might have noticed uh, you might have a typo in your templates, and you might wonder why Angular didn't throw a type error. Uh, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. If, uh, we want to improve that. We know there's some 
is a little better there than with IV we are going to do. And finally, the most important part, IV is completely backwards compatible. So we don't want to tell you uh, you need to change your application to use IV. IV should be something that you turn on a flag and it just works for you. Um, there, there should be no cost to switching. Again, this is very important for us. Uh, we want Angular to be the this evergreen framework that allows you to uh, to use the newest features very seamlessly. So uh, where we are with IV? So unfortunately, I wish I could uh, announce IV right now and say you can go ahead and use it. Uh, we're not ready to say go ahead and use it for your production applications, but I can definitely say go ahead and try it out for your demos and for your little applications. So if you want to start a new application to play around, uh, if you start with dash dash enable Ivy, the new application will have Ivy enabled. Uh, what's important is uh, periodically to up upgrade to the newest uh, head because uh, Ivy was still working on it, was still changing things very rapidly. So if you're trying out Ivy, always make sure to be testing against the head of the repo. Uh, you can go to this website to learn more about Ivy. So as I said, Google, internally in Google, we, um, the way the company does software development, all the code lives in one big repo. And because it lives in, lives in one repo, it has one single dependency point to all of Angular, and we maintain that. So we can go and try to build all the Angular applications in Google with Ivy and run all the tests at once. And we do that like periodically, like every night we do that. And uh, this is where we are. 97% of the tests in Google, and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of tests, pass with IV. So, um, so we know we're almost there. Of course, the last 3% are probably harder. Uh, so it's, it's not that we're 97% 97 done, per se, but we're, uh, we're getting very close, and this is the kind of confidence we have that when we're done with this process and we give IV for everybody to try, uh, they would, it would work for you the same way as it worked for all the internal applications we have. So one thing that uh, we know already works with IV is the simpler debugging story. So uh, now you can set, with IV, you can set breakpoints right in the HTML, and you'll get a uh, the debugger will stop in HTML, and in fact, uh, you know, there's some JavaScript backing it, but using source maps, um, that translation is done automatically, and you can debug a change detection with IV. Uh, as we were building IV, since it's this rethinking of the internals, we got some kind of unexpected benefits. Uh, this was not the explicit goal of IV, but we've noticed, for example, with IV, the memory requirements have gone down. Uh, again, the numbers might vary depending on your application, but what we see is in unit tests, for example, in material unit tests, the memory <coughs> requirements went down 91%. Yeah, because IV is a complete change of the internals, we use very different data structures, and the memory requirements are very different. Um, and of course, if you use less memory, you do less garbage collection, also the, test, the, the time to test uh, material unit tests has gone down. And another bonus is uh, in IV, we took the opportunity to close some long-standing bugs that were actually harder to fix in the old engine. So with IV, uh, some of the bugs that we had open for a long time are fixed. All right, so those are kind of the things that we have done already for IV. So we're getting there. Uh, there are a few things that we're still working on. We still haven't hit our goals for smaller compilation bundles faster compilation and they improve that checking. So that's that's why IV is not ready yet. That's what we're working on right now. So that's all I have for IV. Uh, next, I'm gonna switch gears and talk about one other exciting project that, uh, that is uh, part of the Angular ecosystem. Uh, not not uh, directly part of Angular, but uh, this is uh, using Bazel to build applications, especially large applications like Google. So, so again, uh, depending on how long you've done web development, uh, your story might be different, but when I started web development, JavaScript was not considered kind of a real language, right? These were the real languages, and JavaScript was this thing, this weird scripting thing on the side. You just wrote a little bit of it, and you kind of extended your app, you, you made a little ticker, or you, know, you made a little effect, 
But the real logic of the application was great. I mean, Java and C Sharp, and all the code was there. There was a serious programming, and JavaScript was just uh, inside as a toy. It was at least 10 years ago, I think. So every year, JavaScript becomes more and more, it has more and more features, it has more and more needs, more and more of this complexity is moved from the server to the front. And we're seeing that in all the, all the possible areas, right? You know, we have TypeScript, we have types in JavaScript, we have uh, all these uh, techniques and tools that we know from the back end, and we start using them in the front end because that's what really drives our applications. Front end is powerful enough to make our applications really shine, and sometimes we don't even need a back end. There's like several technologies and so on. So with that shift, uh, there's a one technique from the back end, which is uh, which is dependency management. Uh, so if you again, if you really, you know, if you go really far back, uh, there were tools like Make, and they, what they would do is they would uh, try to track how you change the files and trigger your compilers and uh, do it in the most incremental fashion. So that's a tool like uh, Bazel fits in that same category. Bazel is a tool that one way to think of it is it's like universal watch mode, right? So instead of every single tool having dash dash watch and watching which files change and redoing its work, Bazel is a tool that only specializes that only watches the files, retriggers all the comp compilers that need to be retriggered, but it doesn't itself do any compilation. So it's a coordination tool for all the other tools. So it sounds like, uh, again, uh, maybe you don't need this tool yet, but as the complexity of the front end applications increase, it does provide that many benefits. And that's a tool we use in Google all the time for all our compilations. So here are the benefits. Uh, incremental building and testing. So again, dash dash watch, this incremental aspect uh, is provided by Bazel. What it means is you touch one file, this one file can only affect some part of the application. For example, this one file can only affect some of the tests. Right. So if I change one file, I cannot uh, affect some tests, so there's no need of running it. But to understand that graph of dependencies, the tools need to be smarter. And the Bazel is the tool that does this, this type of smarts. So it knows this one file can only affect the tests here, not the tests there. So if you have a very large application, uh, that's something that you really need if you want to have any reasonable developer experience. Otherwise, everything you change you have to wait minutes for all the tests to run. And that's not, that's not a good experience for you as developers. So Bazel uh, provides incrementality for building and testing. It is completely full stack. So uh, in Google, we use Bazel for all the languages. So Java, JavaScript, C++, uh, Python, Go, any language we have in Google, it integrates with Bazel. So it, again, it orchestrates all the compilers. All the compilers integrate with Bazel for incremental building and testing. And finally, Bazel allows you to put the artifacts of the build to the cloud so you can share them with your coworkers and get even faster builds. So if your coworker has built in some state of the world, you should get to reuse their build, right? You shouldn't spend CPU cycles rebuilding on your own machine for the same exact output. Uh, so who uses Bazel? Uh, of course, Google is by far the largest user of Bazel. Uh, it's actually, it's very well established in Google, but it's new as an open source project. So the open source project is kind of still ramping up. <coughs> Internally, we use Google for everything. Uh, I can give you an anecdote. Uh, so as part of my job, I have to upgrade a TypeScript compiler at Google. Right? So we have one single version for any project in Google that uses TypeScript. So we're talking about millions of lines of code. There's a single file called TypeScript.js. Right? Uh, I can go in, one, in the giant repo we have and change that file to 3.4 to 3.5. And then mm -hmm. I can go to Bazel and say, run all the tests. And when I say run all the tests, I literally mean all the tests in Google for everything. Right? So that's like Gmail, search, backend, frontend, Java, C sharp. I just say run all the tests. I don't care. Figure it out. Bazel figures out this one file can only go to these compilations. These tests are not affected by this change, so I don't need to run those tests. And one hour later, I get results of all the breaking, all the breakages for this one change. So I can change the compiler for uh, about thousands of engineers, millions of code, 
And this is all powered by Kublai Base. Again, this makes sense for our setup because it's a very big company with many uh, lots of code. Uh, in your setup, you might have different trade-offs, but you can you can I think understand the power of Maisel uh, that we really benefit in, in Google. A Lucy Chart is another company that uses Bazel. Uh, it's based in Salt Lake City, uh, Logi Ocean. I think it's a startup in China, maybe. And of course, Angular itself on GitHub uses Bazel. So that's Angular by itself, by at this point, on GitHub is a quite large project. So it really benefits uh, from the build tool Bazel provides, and uh, it's using it. So uh, we're ready to announce a preview for Bazel, similar to Ivy. So we're not ready to. Uh, we, we, we're, we're not switching the CLI default, but there's a preview. The CLI has this very nice abstraction there of builders right here that abstracts all the tooling that runs underneath. So these are the default ones that you're using right now. And there's a base of builders that are uh, ready for preview. They're experimental. And with this command, uh, you can go and try them on. And they're <coughs> There's a nice um, there's a nice blog post at Angular.io that would walk you through what you expect to see there. Uh, so with Angular Bazel, you'll get you get the basic Bazel tooling immediately part of your ng serve, ng create, ng build. Alright, I am now I pass it back to Miles. Thanks, Rado. Um, so Rado just told you about a lot of cool things that um, have, are kind of in the works in Angular. Um, but as you know, I work on Angular components, uh, so maybe you're wondering what I've been working on, uh, other than clearly watching lots of Terrace House. <laughs> um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about that now. Um, so you may have noticed uh, recently our repo name on GitHub actually changed from Angular slash Material 2 um, to Angular slash Components. Uh, and the reason for this is that we think the components name better reflects what our team actually does. Uh, so obviously, um, the material design components that we do uh, is a big part of our job, but it's not the only thing that we do. We also um, maintain the uh, component development kits, the CDK, and this is a set of uh, interaction patterns and building blocks that you can use in your own applications and in your own uh, component libraries. And so that's really to do with um, material specifically. So we think that components better encapsulates what our team does. Um, of course, nothing's changing, but the you know, main material is still a, a huge focus of ours. Um, and we love the work that we do. Um, but so along those lines, we've been thinking about uh, how can we better balance some of the work that we do. Um, because uh, currently, you know, we spend most of our time on a material, and there's there's some other stuff we'd like to do in the CK and maybe some other packages to help improve the component ecosystem. And so we've been thinking about how we might uh, free up some time to do that. And so currently, this is kind of what, um, at a very high level, our setup looks like. We um, develop these building blocks in the CDK, and then we consume them in Angular Material, and we uh, use them to build up the material design components. And then, of course, in addition to the CDK utilities, we have to write all of this uh, logic and um, you know, UI and CSS in order to get the components to look like new code design components. Um, and so this actually takes a lot of effort, um, all this you know, code to get the material design look and feel. Uh, and the, the material design spec isn't even a static thing. So we might get our component looking just right, but then you know, no sooner do we do that, then material design releases a new version, and we have to go and update everything. So that kind of you know leads to situations like this, um, where the, these are examples of two different sets of material design components. One of them is angle material. I can tell which one uh, just by looking at it. I don't know if you can. Um, but that's a problem, right? I shouldn't be able to tell. Like material design should be material design, regardless of the library that you use uh, to implement. Um, and so we we want to try to solve this and close this gap so that. It's, uh, we get a more consistent material design experience across all applications inside of Google and outside of Google. And so uh, Google actually maintains another open source project called MTC Web uh, that we think might help 
help us with this problem. Um, and so MDC Web is a collection of canonical primitives uh, for material design components on the web. Um, I say primitives because it's, a, it's just uh, HTML and JavaScript and CSS. It's not anything that's tied to a particular framework. In fact, MDC Web has gone out of their way to write their code so that it can be consumed by many different frameworks. Um, Angular, React, Vue, um, web components, uh, really whatever you want, you should be able to consume MDC Web. Um, and so what MDC Web gives us is uh, one SAS mix-ins to apply the material design styles you know, to make a button look like a material design button. <laughs> Uh, and they give us TypeScript classes that encapsulate the business logic of the component. So, you know, some, uh, some of the material design components might have a little bit more complex behavior, such as the form field where, where you, you know, click into it and the label goes up. Right? Um, but importantly, their classes don't do any of the DOM interaction directly. They delegate all of the DOM interaction to an adapter class. And so this means that it's really just the, the logic of the component itself um, that's captured. And then they don't um, actually provide any HTML at all. They give guidelines for how you should structure your HTML and what classes you can apply to elements um, in order to make it uh, look uh, the way you want. Um, this is, all, all three of these points make it actually a great fit for Angular Material. I mean, we already use SAS mixins for our theming, um, which is a great fit for this. Uh, we want all of our DOM interaction to go through Angular, but we have the same business logic for these components, right? Like just like MDC Web's you know, text field label needs to float, so does ours. And then, of course, we want our HTML to be in Angular templates, uh, which we're free to do since um, the HTML is left up to the user. And so what we want to do in the future is move towards more of this model, where we maintain uh, our building blocks and interaction patterns in the CDK. And then we consume that along with the uh, MDC primitives in Angular Material. And we write code to kind of glue these things together and create material design components for Angular Material um, without having to maintain all of the, the UI uh, code ourselves like we're currently doing. And so the goals for this is going to be like one, most importantly, we want the same API for our components as the existing ones that you're using. Right? That's not going to change. Um, uh, you know, that checkbox is still going to be called that checkbox. It will have all of the same inputs and outputs that we're used to. Right? So you can you know, find the checked value to true or some variable. And then all the programmatic APIs will be the same too, right? So if you get like a new child reference to a net select, and then call open on it, that will be exactly the same. Um, and then by using these MDC based, uh, uh, um, by using the MDC library behind the hood, we'll be able to create a more consistent material design experience that aligns better with the spec. Uh, the material, uh, the MDC web team actually is part of the material design team at Google. Uh, so they have direct access to the designers. Uh, and therefore, they have the most up-to-date um, you know, styles that match the spec. Also, at the same time, this means that it's going to be less duplicated effort for us on the Angular Material team. Right? We get to use the, the awesome work that the MVC team is already doing instead of doing that, again, ourselves. And so this gives us more time to work on things like additional utilities for the CDK, um, maybe data visualization components, which is something that we have wanted to do in the past, but we never had time. So we think it will really free up some, some time for us. And we actually have um, you know, early versions of some of these components available right now on our material experimental package. They are experimental, so don't put them in the production app. And they might <coughs> um, but we have button checkbox, menu, and slide toggle uh, available now, and we are working on adding some more. So please check that out. So you may have said when I when I was talking about the API not changing, that's great, but what about the tests? 
Um, because oftentimes in tests, you'd have to poke around at things that may not necessarily be the public key. Uh, so here, let's look at an example. Say I want to, I have a component that uses a map select, and I want to write a test for it. I want to open the select, select an option, and check that you know, some stuff happened. And so the first thing I need to do is actually know that it's the uh, the map select trigger element that I'm looking for. That's the element I need to click on, and that's an internal element to the map selects template. So I kind of have to know about it in the test. So I grab that, I click it, I detect changes, and now I have to know that the options I'm looking for all have the class dot map option. So I can go ahead, get those, grab maybe the fourth option is the one that I want to click on, and then I can click it, detect changes. And go ahead and check that everything is the way I expect it to be. Um, but you know, this kind of required me to poke around at, at internals. And if I switch out the backing of the, the mass select, if I switch out its DOM for the MVC based DOM, this isn't going to be the same anymore. Because um, MVC is not going to have a mass select trigger in class. Uh, and so, you know, if you were to just switch to using the MVC components with your test like this, it would break. And so we want to um, come up with a way to help you prepare your tests so that when you switch to the MVC based components, um, it will just keep working. And so we have an idea for this, uh, and it's called uh, component test harnesses. And so this is the same test, but written with one of these test harnesses. And it's basically the way it works is we get a loader for our test harness environment. And then we use that loader to say, we want to find a map select harness. The map select harness already knows that its, uh, you know, its selector is called map select. So it goes ahead and finds that on the page for me. And now, I, instead of having to know about what the trigger element is and get that and click on it, all I do is say, wait, select that. Right? And that'll, um, that'll go open the select. If there's any asynchronous behavior, if it does like a set timeout or anything, that needs to be a wait. Uh, and then the async syntax at the top. It's just going to uh, wait for that before continuing. And then once it's open, I can go ahead and I don't I don't have to know it's the fourth option anymore. I can say, click on the option that says some stuff, wherever that may be. Um, the harness is smart enough to go locate the, the correct option. And then I can uh, click on that uh, again using a wait. And finally, I can uh, do my assertions that I did in the previous step. And so with this model, if we switch to the MVC, nothing would break, right? Um, we would have a, a separate implementation of this same harness API, but for the MVC-based components. And it would be the one that knows about what the, what the trigger element is, not the test. And so essentially, what these component test harnesses will be is an interface for interacting with components in your tests. Um, and the way you interact with them uh, through this harness will be a similar way uh, in that, as to how a user would interact uh, with your components. Right? So users don't go um, grabbing some internal elements and you know, worrying about that. They just open the select. Right? And so you do a similar sort of interaction pattern in your tests. Uh, and then these harnesses um, are going to work in both end-to-end -end and unit tests. So you only need to learn one API and it'll work across all of your tests. Um, and we think that it will result in tests that are both more readable and less brittle. Uh, and so specifically the way that it helps make it less brittle is one, you no longer de depend on the implement de implementation details of the DOM, like I was showing you on the last page. Um, the, the other way that it helps is it abstracts out timing details. Uh, so you probably noticed that I started using the, the async await syntax when I switched over to the harness. And uh, what that allows me to do is, is basically uh, abstract away any kind of like set timeouts or something like that. So you may have noticed in the past, sometimes you'll upgrade to a, a minor or a patch release, and then you'll still get some tests failing. And the reason is that we introduced a new set timeout, and your test hasn't taken this into account. Um, by using the harness and the async await, we can update the harness to know about the new set timeout. And then your test doesn't have to worry about it. You know, just keep working. And again, we can, we can use this idea to make it very easy to transition to the MDC-based components. <coughs> this is also available um, as a preview in our experimental packages. So uh, again, experimental, so don't rely on it yet. 
but if you want to test it out, um, the uh, framework for the harness is at CDK Experimental. And an example harness for the material checkbox is in the material experimental package. Okay, so thank you so much, all of you, for coming. Um, I hope you have a great time at this conference. Uh, please do not hesitate, as Rohan mentioned, to come up to either me or Rado. We would love to talk to you about Angular or anything. If you have nothing Angular to talk about, come like try to teach me some Japanese. I would love to learn. <laughs> I'm not that good. <laughs> Thank you. Arigatou gozaimasu.